you see we have this reversal of reality that takes place whereby the sane under white supremacy domination becomes defined as the insane and everything else is somewhere in between. And so you see that this is a very powerful system of mind control that is being imposed upon the African mind under white supremacy domination. And I call it cultural misorientation because I think that that's where the deficiency lies. You see, power comes from culture. That's what Sister Marimba was talking about. That's where power comes from. Power doesn't come from voting. Power doesn't come from, you know, owning a store. Power comes from your being in control of your definition of reality, being defined by your history, you see, your philosophy, you see, your social reality. And from that, you understand the importance of owning the store, of owning the city, owning the state, owning the country owning the world, you see, that only from that base. And I think that erroneous conception is running rampant in our community, is that we don't understand power because we don't understand culture. And I think that that's why we deny that we are cultural people. I mean, we'll have blood out here, on, I mean, serious and sincere about mounting a change. You see, I mean, out here on the, on the battlefront, talking about liberating the African mind and not never mention our cultural reality, never even give any legitimacy to it. And so what happens then is that we're talking about liberating ourselves as black-skinned white people, yes. not as people. And so we don't develop an African objective, you see, an African purpose, and therefore extract an African outcome for that. So I think that that's, it, it's very important that we, this construct of cultural misorientation uh, become an understandable one for us. Because I think if it doesn't, we are going to continue to be walking around here like we have our heads cut off, trying to solve problems where the answers are right under our nose. And we are hiring somebody with a PhD or somebody else to go find it for us, and it's right there. And they going way out of town, look, you see kind of thing, and charging you a lot of money to do it, <laughs> you see, in that regard. So I think that, you know, that, that this construct is, is very critical, I think, to, to getting us in a sense of that. Let me just say one more thing about it before I go on. That, you see, I think that one thing we have to recognize about our condition as African people is to be African under white supremacy domination is an unnatural situation. Thank you. There's nothing natural about that. And African people must recognize that. But white domination, miseducation of African people, right. have us accepting that as possibly normal, a normal way of life or a natural way of life, that that's OK. All we want to do is own a house, yep. uh, you know, be able to have somebody on the city council, yep. uh, to, you know, to, to have, these, have something, something that ultimately is strengthening white supremacy domination system. See, because if we're not out to destroy it, Everything that we do is doing nothing more than reinforcing it. No matter how much we participate in it and how much we think we can strain out of that participation, so long as we try to participate in it, we are giving legitimacy to it, and therefore we are, in fact, reinforcing its existence. So I think that, that, that we have to be very careful about this cultural misorientation because in the, in the ranks of leadership among our people, that's where you find it most, most forcefully manifested, in the ranks of leadership among our Now, it's everywhere, don't get me wrong. But it is very severely manifested in the ranks of leadership of African people. Because they think they understand power. And even more absurdly, they think they understand white supremacy domination. And they are the biggest casualties of it because they actually believe that they can achieve African liberation by working through a structure that white supremacy domination created. And will not only will they try to convince us of the legitimacy of that, they will try to bring punishing consequences to bear upon us 
if we don't comply. Yeah. Whether it's through name calling, or uh, withdrawing social status and social recognition from us, you know, and that can go in all kinds of ways, you know, in concrete ways like fire you, lose your job, you know, all kinds of other things, you see. So that we will get our African selves in line <laughs> with white supremacy domination. So I think that, that uh, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, I call, I, call this, I call this book a wake-up call for the African world because I think that we, we're just like drug addicts, you know. I think we are addicted to the European worldview. And, and withdrawal is a very, a very challenging process. It is a very challenging process. If you know anything about addiction, that's, it takes all the energy you got, <laughs> you see, to try to and get out of that, to get out from under the weight, you see, of that addiction. And you will come up with every justification and rationalization you can, you see, to in fact reinforce it. I often use this analogy, uh, I've been in this, the, it's, uh, been fortunate enough, I guess, to be involved in the more progressive wings of this liberation movement for the last 20 years. And I've tried to be a keen observer because when I entered it, I was rather young. And to watch and see what was going on, you know, and see what we do and seem to be doing right and what seemed to be working and what we seem to be doing wrong. And one observation I've come out of that experience with is that we have as many contradictions in the most progressive movement of African liberation as we have anywhere else in the African community. As any place else. I notice everybody got a little quiet on that one. <laughs> but, uh, but the point I'm making is that, you see, uh, we got so much baggage that we have collected in our sojourn on the white supremacy domination that I use this analogy about, say, if the African liberation train has been announced, you know, it's going to leave the station <laughs> next week at 8 a.m. and all serious-minded Africans should be at the station to get on so we can liberate ourselves from white supremacy domination. Now, we're not talking about Africans who are confused about the Africans and all of We're talking about the ones who say they're ready. <laughs> That's the group we're talking about now. I would submit to you that when the fog lifts that morning, you know, on Liberation Day, the train is leaving the station, and all the brothers and sisters gather, everybody's going to have these duffel bags, <laughs> you know. And just imagine the wisdom of the ancestors designed the entryway, you know, onto the train. Very now, it's set that just you can get through it. Okay? What you think's gonna happen? Blood's gonna be trying to get through that door with them duffel bags, get stuck in the door. <laughs> and here come a wise elder, you know, one of the conductors on the train, one of our wise elders, come along and give some, you know, well, maybe if you try to leave that duffel bag, you can get home. No, 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 I can't leave this, brother. I got, it's too important. I got some important things in here. And can you imagine if we had something like customs, you know, when you come through? So they say, okay, this is, this is chaotic now. Hey, wait a minute. We didn't plan for this. Let's dump these bags out here. Let's see what's in here. You justify, you know, this stuff you're trying to get through here so we can get the train moving. And blood start dumping out those bags. I would suggest to you that we would try to justify every last thing in the bag. Whether it's some alien religion. No, 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 man, I need this. I'm committed to it. I got to keep it. This is, my, this is me, you know. Whether it's all these Eurocentric-like cosmetics. No, 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 I can't live without this stuff. I got, you know, it's got, that's me. I can't, I can't leave that. Hey, listen to this one. These Eurocentric names. I said, no, 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 no. I can't leave this stuff behind. I wouldn't know myself by any other name. How can I leave that? You see? I'm talking about in the progressive circles of African life. I have witnessed this. You see? I mean, I've been in the situation where we've been harmony getting ready to lay out the plan and getting ready to action plan. And all of a sudden, we stepped on somebody's toe, something in their bag. We stepped on it. They said, wait a minute. The whole meeting broke.
broke up into disintegration and started talking about what's in the bag. <laughs> and here we talking about we getting ready to mount an offensive against white supremacy domination. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I mean, we were moving in harmony, everybody's rolling the rhythm until we infringe upon somebody's duffel bag. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody goes back and draws out their duffel bag. <laughs> And now we got the duffel bags are between, you see. They are between African people. All this junk that we have collected from white supremacy domination is in the way. And I contend that we've got to have specific rituals that allow us to resolve that problem before it continues to occur. It seems to me that our scholars should recognize that we have been studying this problem long enough to be able to recognize what some of our fundamental deficits are and build in correctives of those deficits before they destroy our thrust toward victory. And, we, and therefore, we need rituals. As the sister was saying, we need, see, there are, there are rituals that we should go back into our African tradition and bring some rituals forward just as they are intact. Because they mean something, you see, intact. You can't, you can't separate them outside, you see, and put in and fragment them. You must bring them full fledged for the spiritual integrity of them, you see, to achieve its vitality and expression. But the African, you see, experience is transformative. It didn't stop with Kemet. It didn't stop with traditional West African civilization. This is a part of it, too. Just happened to be a highly distorted and confused and disordered part of it. But it's still a part of the legitimate African experience. Once we, once we come through the transformation of African consciousness, we'll understand that. We'll understand that it's not just that you were born in, you were born in continental Africa, so we say those are Africans, we the blacks. Yeah. Or we the Afro-Americans. Or we the we prefix, you see. We're not just Africans. Like them, or as a brother, I don't mean to offend anybody, but a brother called on the phone the other day, said, we 50-50, yeah. you know? <laughs> you know, so we're not African, you know, we 50-50. 50-something 50 50 else and 50 African. <laughs> so we got to give equal weight, equal time to the something else. We won't even deal with what that one is until a little later. But he's talking about the something else again. And that's defining, the something else is defining who we are and reducing, you see, the substance of the Africanity. And so what happened, that's baggage, you see, that's all it is, that's a double bag. That's a double bag coming up again. And you know, we all got them. We all got them. And if we don't go through this self-searching process that Sister Marimba talked about, those double bags is going to always be, we just hide, we'll live in the corner until we need them, that's all. <laughs> until somebody offends us. And then we, hey, <laughs> open it out, <laughs> lay it on the table. And everybody else say, hey, I got mine too then. <laughs> there goes the plan. There goes the plan. Now I know there, I know, I know some of us in this room, but I know we've been in this movement for a long time and we have seen this happen. We have seen it happen. Get to the point of getting ready to get into some substantive action. And all of a sudden, all this disharmony, all these other agendas start hitting the table. And we leave the room <laughs> mad at each other. If we didn't get go get physical, you know, feeling like we should have, we didn't get the satisfaction and so on and so forth. That's dangerous, brothers and sisters. We got to come into a sense of this reality. Uh, we, uh, we will never be able to even think victoriously and let alone be able to then envision actual victory. And so I believe that the way we begin to correct ourselves from this cultural misorientation or engage in the African healing process is that we can't continue to make this error that we always make of trying to start at step 10. Uh -huh. Assuming or presuming that somebody, I guess that means white supremacy or somebody has taken care of steps one through nine. Because we want to act, again, we get caught up in this equivalence with Europeans. And so therefore, we want to say, well, we, we, we straight. I mean, we, know, we, we done purged out all of this, this baggage. We ready to go. So we're going to go on and start with point 10. You know, let's go get us a store. Let's go 
you know, start us a school or so on and so forth or what have you. When we haven't done the groundwork, you see, that lays the foundation for that to come into being. And so I think that that's what we have to do. If we're going to really develop a victorious plan, and I consistently challenge us throughout that manuscript about that, then first of all, we have to, somebody has to have the vision, the audacity, the courage, the African-centered courage or audacity to envision a master plan and articulate that plan to the best of their ability, drawing upon the collective wisdom of African people to our people. We must have a purpose for what we're doing. You can't go out and tell African people, well, you got to stop raising your children that way so they'll stop fighting. Come on now, that's not going to work. We got to have a plan that we can give to all African people because those over here say, well, mine not fighting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what about mine? I'm still having problems. They're not fighting, but they don't want to do the school work or they don't want to, whatever, we're having some problems with them. I think we have to envision what is it that we need. And I contend that we go back and study our history yes. and study this encroachment of the European, we will find that what they have destroyed about African people is our cultural infrastructure. And so that's what we must rebuild if we are going to mount a victorious struggle against white supremacy domination. We can't do that as individual Africans. We can't do that as a couple of us who are mad and we, you know, got our energy. We're going to go, you know, kick some white supremacy behind, you see. We have to develop a systematic, you know, if you will, for lack of a better term, scientific methodology for liberating ourselves. See, if you're serious, that's one thing I'll always say about Brother Bobby. He was always true to the fact that Brother Bobby believed in victory. He wasn't just out there struggling to be struggling said if we're going to struggle, we're struggling to win. Not to win some skirmishes against white supremacy domination, but to literally defeat it. And the only way he saw us defeating it is that we must reclaim control of the world. Now, you can say, well, that's a tall order. You know, that's abstract, ball, and that's kind of out there, you know, <laughs> given the fact that we sitting back here can't even control our block. <laughs> you know, many of us can't control our houses, you know, our homes, you know, in that regard. So it becomes a tall order to say we got to control the world. But again, I can, and I contend that's the fault of our scholarship. You see, our scholarship is supposed to be laying out the paradigm for this liberation movement. And I think that if we don't somehow lay out the master plan, we have no way of of connecting the various isolated project, liberation projects that are going on all over the African community. They are independent projects, you yes, see. They are. Meaningful, but not nearly as meaningful I as if they were brought under the umbrella of a mega objective of African world order, of what I call a pan-African world nation building. Mm -hmm. That we have to Develop an objective that say, we want to reclaim the world. We can't be talking about reclaiming Washington, D.C. <laughs> oh, we got to talk about the world. And then reclaiming the turf of Washington, D.C. makes sense because it's a part of our long-term developmental plan of retaking the world. Retaking our homes, then retaking our neighborhoods, then retaking our blocks then retaking our cities, then makes sense, you see. Otherwise, we're just retaking them to work them through for white supremacy domination all the time. If we have no other agenda, then that's, we can't claim anything. We can't claim this plan is about anything, because if they run in the world, and we run our neighborhoods, and they're going to they construct a policy that says neighborhoods got to run like such and such, and we will enforce that policy, you see. So the neighborhood control plan has to be linked to the world control plan. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. We are in a fantasy. We are playing with this struggle. We are not struggling to win, you see. And so I think that 
if this model does anything, it tries to locus this, this African personality within the liberation movement so that it thrusts us toward the real objective of the African liberation movement. And that is for African people to run the world again. Not for us to participate in a world controlled by white supremacy domination. You are not going to be able to integrate with white supremacy domination. That is mentally disordered thinking. You see? In formal circles of psychiatry and psychology, we call that fantasy thinking. You see? And when you're living in a fantasy world, something's wrong with you. You see? And we have a whole lot of fantasies defining the African condition under white supremacy domination. We have a whole lot of fantasy. A very important thing that I think we lost in this culture infrastructure under white supremacy domination is we lost respect for and a sense of accountability to our ancestors. Yes. We don't show any respect for the African who made it possible for us to be here today. And you know what? Same thing occurs or characterizes these progressive centers of the African liberation movement. That in all of this progressiveness that we've established, why is it that nobody, no, no great insight has occurred that somebody say, well, we need a national shrine to let the world know, you see, what our ancestors went through so that we can commit ourselves to never permit it to happen again, you see. But how can we do that if we want to forget it? We want to operate in this amnesia because we've been so miseducated, so intimidated by white supremacy domination that they make us feel ashamed of our ancestors. We are ashamed. They make us feel like it's our fault. That's right. Or like one of the callers made the other day said, these people have increased the quality of African life yeah. by brutalizing us, by raping us, by murdering us, by destroying us. How crazy can you get? That's insane. That is white supremacy logic for an African person to be able to make such an insane statement and no Africans are rushing to that person to get them in a straitjacket and get them some help. That person probably went down the street and got an award that night for something. You see, it is, it is a chaotic world in which the African personality, you see, is striving for legitimacy under white supremacy domination because the contradiction is there. Africans under white supremacy domination and cultural misorientation can stand up before the whole world and make the most nonsensical, illogical statement and either be applauded for it, awarded for it, or given some extra bonus for it. And nobody is the wiser. And the next one of us say, well, better do the same thing. Yeah. And surely enough, somebody is on their heels getting ready to do, to engage in the same kind of insanity. I mean, it just makes no sense. Let me just tell you this little, one little, one little uh, experience I had in California in the, in the mid 70s. When Andy Young, I think was the, uh, was he the, the, yeah, uh, the, the United Nations, yes, right, that thing. <laughs> and President Amin was, you know, was uh, in, in, in power in Uganda. And the European press was going crazy. I mean, they were saying, this is a wild man. I mean, he's murdering African people. He's disrespecting royalty from Europe, you know, and this, you know, these people making them carry him around, you know, like Bawana, you know, you know, like we carry them around, you know, kind of thing. But it's crazy for him to do that and so on and so forth.